Well, good evening, everyone. I hope you are all well and have had a good uh, Monday. Uh, my name is Chris Morn. I'm the Head of Entrepreneurship and Innovation here at Robert Gordon University. And welcome to what is our last Innovation Masterclass of the session. There will be more coming, of course, because we know how much you enjoy them. But um, this is the last one of the session. And I think it's been a fabulous um, a few uh, enterprise masterclasses and innovation masterclasses that we have had. Um, and I wanted to remind you of some of them um, because I don't know if you know, today is World Poetry Day. The 21st of March each year is World Poetry Day. And so I'm actually going to recite a poem um, that I think epitomizes the spirit of all our speakers. I heard it this morning on Radio 2. But you'll recall that we had Mark Logan um, talking about why startups fail and uh, giving us some pointers as to how we can ensure that we create startups that don't fail. And just quickly, you remember that he visited us and he was speaking about the Guinness World Record. Oh, he spoke about the Guinness World Record um, that, he, that he was doing and how he overcame a number of challenges to do those, um, those world records uh, and how he was cycling. Um, and across, he kept coming backwards and forwards across the channel to try and uh, beat his record. And then of course, we heard last time out, we heard from Lucinda Bruce Gardine, who spoke about Genius Foods and she was the founder of Genius Foods, overcoming some of the challenges that her son had in terms of being a celiac. And so, you know, we've also had uh, Poco Coffee speak, some of our startup teams, so Ross from Poco Coffee, we had Ewan and Hannah from Ampla, and we had um, the chaps from Origin speaking about their startups. And you know, often they have to overcome the challenges. And so I thought this poem epitomizes some of the challenges that people facing, uh, not just in their businesses and in their, the way and things that they want to achieve, but in the world at the moment. And it's called Don't Quit. And it's by Edgar Guest. When things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems uphill, when funds are low but debts are high, and you want to smile but have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but do not quit. Life is strange with its twists and turns as every one of us sometimes learns and many failures turn about when we might have won had we stuck it out. Don't give up though the pace seems slow, you may succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt, you can never tell how close you are. It may be near, yet it seems so far. So stick to the fight when you're hardest hit. It's when things seem worst that you must not quit. So I think that epitomizes some of the entrepreneurs that we have been working with in the, in the past few years here at Robert Gordon University. And it actually epitomizes our first speaker today as well. So I'm delighted that we've got two fantastic speakers for you this evening. Um, the first one, is a good friend of ours, a Lucy Fisher, um, who is a, gr a graduate. Have you graduated now, Lucy? Are you still yes, yeah. you graduated now from architecture? Founder of a company called Knit It that you probably would have heard about because there's been had a lot of publicity recently. Um, was in our 2020 Startup Accelerator and she actually won the Sunday Live event that we had. But since then, she's gone on to build her brand, to build her business. She now has a number of people working alongside her. She, was, uh, she won Scottish Edge, Young Edge and Creative Edge round 16 winner. She was also the Young Innovator. She won the Young Innovators Award in 20, 2021 as well. One of only 64 entrepreneurs across the whole of the UK that was in, won that award. She was Converge Creative Challenge winner in October 2021. She's a, and this year, she's a finalist in the Young Scott Award Enterprise category, which I believe are going to be award ceremony down in Edinburgh on April the 27th. So that was a big introduction for you there, there Lucy. But the other thing about you, Lucy, is you've kept your feet on the ground. I was on your website and I, you know, fantastically inspired by the values that you have on your website. You talk about inspire, ooze passion, innovate, be quirky, which I love. I think you have a quirky and to nurture as well. And so we'd love to hear from you, hear your story, uh, and I'll pass over to you. So ladies and gentlemen, I'll introduce to you, Lucy Fisher. Perfect. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, and I know that that introduction seems really like <laughs> quite crazy, but it actually ties back to your poem right there, um, uh, Don't Quit. And 
I would say there's been so many points where I've wanted to pack it all in, but again, um, entering all these things and the success, the success that we've had has definitely been worth it at the end. So the hard times definitely are forgotten for, in place of the good. Um, so I'll just, I'll share my screen and start the presentation. No, not working yet. Yeah, that was looking uh, good. That was fine. There we go. Yep, that's it. I'm, ne I'm nearly there. I just need to get the notes to come up at the side. Um, is that still okay? Yeah, that looks good. Have I lost it? Is it still there? Oh, it's gone back to to the original view, I think. Okay, right. I'm just gonna have to do it out of my head. I can't get the notes up side by side. So you, here we go. We'll at wing it. We'll be we'll be creative as we go. We're looking at so, deck. Oh, on the top there. Um okay, so hello. Uh, I'm Lucy, founder and creative director of Knit It. Um, and my story starts not changing his life now. There we go. Um, as part of cohort two um, of the RGU Accelerator. So I've done a wee arrow, there's me speaking to the lovely Chris. Um, and basically I arrived at the Accelerator with an idea and that was all I had. And um, since then I've been on a journey and a process to learn how to actually turn that into a business. Um, so my idea um, basically is founded on my childhood hobby, which was knitting. So I learned to knit at age eight, taught by my grandma. Um, however, I felt that knitting was stuck in the past and really needed updated to inspire um, the younger generation to want to do it. And so that's what I came with, an idea and an ambition. Um, so a wee bit of background just before I jump into the creative side of it. Um, in 2020, we launched our first product, which is a knitting kit, turning photos into knitting patterns. So here's a little shameless Mother's Day plug. If you haven't got um, any presents yet, give us a look um, and see what you think. Um, but behind the scenes for the past sort of year and a half, we've been working on the, the big vision, really, which is a new platform which will revolutionise the industry. And um, so I'll go into a bit more detail. So firstly, how would I define creativity? I think it is more than ideas. I think it is the process of making an idea reality. So creating a thing from nothing. Um, and why is creativity important? I had a big think about this and I've kind of come up with three reasons um, and a wee bit of story on how I reached the conclusions for that. So. The first reason I think is the most obvious um, in, in that we need to be creative because we need to continue the basic sort of advancement of the world. We need new ideas, we need to innovate and we need to make things better, which is what we've been doing for the past thousands of years. So that's nothing new, nothing groundbreaking there. Um, but when I was working in ASDA, they had a catchphrase, which I'm sure if any of you have also been an ASDA colleague may remember, which was don't walk by. And what they meant by that was simply, um, if you're walking up an aisle and it's a mess, tidy it up, don't walk by, um, in order to make the, the environment for the customers good. But I've sort of taken that and applied a similar but slightly different meaning that if you come across something and you see a way to make it better, don't walk by, make it better. Take on the responsibility and make that reality happen. So with me, uh, with knitting, I don't think it's it's right for the age, basically. I think there's ways we can make it better, ways that we can inspire young people to want to knit. So I've not walked by. I've taken on um, the challenge, basically, and formed the company uh, from that sort of philosophy. And that, that was the bit there about knitting being old-fashioned and a funny little slide. Um, so number two, why is creativity important? 
Um, so if there's any high power fans, there's a little pun here. I think creativity is important because you need to be rememberable or memorable. Um, so basically, I think you need to stand out in business. You need to be different from everybody else. And that's why creativity is important. So I did have planned a, a wee experiment for today. Um, because I was going to be in the room, I was going to say um, we're very close to hitting 500 Instagram subscribers. So if you're in the room or at home, jump on Instagram right now. And the first six people who we're going to follow at Hello Knit It. So that's at underscore Hello Knit It. Um, we're going to run up and grab a free donut. So what I was trying to do is create an experience that you would remember. Hopefully you'd say, oh, I remember that time I won a donut from that girl. What was it? Knitting, something like that. And it may have flopped. It may have been an absolute disaster. But part of creativity, I think, is also about taking risks. Um, and at the end of the day, if the risk didn't pay off, it was win-win for me because I would have had six donuts to take home. Um, but yeah, try it. And if it works, stick with it. And if it doesn't, try something else. Um, and then the third reason why creativity is important is simply that it is fun. It's like, I know I would much rather be some, doing something fun than something boring. I'd much rather be building something with Lego, for example, than doing the ironing. Um, so if you can make, I'm quite lucky that I've been able to make my hobby into a business and we're in the process of making that potentially something that could be could be quite big but it's also fun so again win-win so I often get asked how did I come up with the idea for knit it I find this one quite a difficult uh, question to ask so I mean the story starts I was just wandering the streets in Budapest in back in November 2019 and Funnily enough, ideas tend to come to me when I'm near water. So there's a big, big river that splits Budapest in two. Um, and we were just sightseeing, basically. And also, I'll just chuck in a random fact. Budapest is the home of the Rubik's Cube. Um, and that's a good creative challenge if anybody's interested as well. And um, so anyway, ideas come to me when I'm surrounded by water. So again, that can be things like rivers and beaches, which are quite relaxing, or it can also be when I'm swimming or even as crazy as in the bath. Um, and I think the reason for that is, it's during these moments um, in these sort of relaxing places, my brain sort of shuts down from the day to day, the busy sort of what's going on in that moment. And all the ideas that have been whizzing around in the background get the chance to just come into the foreground. So all the, the connections that I've made or the, the little things, observations I've picked up, they come forward and they just kind of meld into ideas without me really having to think about them but I think it's just taking that moment to kind of stop forget about the day and just let ideas be um so yeah so I can't really answer that question when people ask me how did you come up with it I think it's just been something that's been in the back of my head for for years and years and then one day it just came out um so how did you turn the idea into a business so this one for me, um, I think this talk is about inspiring people to be creative. I think I'm quite like a naturally creative person. So what I actually had to learn was the opposite. I had to learn like a business persona. I had to learn how to do the more mundane sort of required tasks like accounts and finance and all the regulations and the, the things you don't even really realise. Um, and that can be quite overwhelming as well. So for me, what I had to do was I had to break it down into little chunks and see the stepping stones of how this idea could become a reality. So just do small strategic moves that gradually um, get you towards that loading bar being full. And of course, that loading bar was back and forth and back and forth because it's not a straight path um, along the way. But um. The other thing as well, I can't remember if there's another slide or not, no. The other thing I was going to say on this part uh, as well was, I think creativity, you hear it a lot more with like writers and you get writer's block a lot. So that, that happened to me is when I have so many ideas and I don't feel that they're progressing, that's when it gets really difficult for me to want to continue 
project. And again, it's just important on trying to get 80% of the way there. And then that's enough of an achievement and it keeps things moving. And eventually um, you start whizzing through it again. So what has the journey been like so far? So like I said before, um, being sort of a creative person, I'm used to sort of being in my own head with my own ideas and just sort of making them for me. And the journey, therefore, what I've had to do in creating this sort of business persona has taken me out of my comfort zone. Um, so thing, I think the hardest thing has probably been learning how to like explain the idea and express it and communicate it to other people. So a lot of that is in terms of like the networking and the building relationships with potential partners um, and just generally learning how to, to speak about the idea in a different way. Um, Cause I can get so focused on like the creative aspects of it and forget about the, the other important like business side of things that you need to kind of learn how to explain and describe to the people who are going to be less interested in the creative aspect because their disciplines, their profession, their expertise is actually um, in a different zone. So I'd say that's been the most challenging thing on this journey for me is switching from being that that sort of fun, idearsy, arty, colourful and um, creative sort of mindset and actually having a business mindset as well. And um, some of the creative highlights so far that we've had um, are some of our award-winning pitches. Um, so this brings me back to why I think creativity is important. Most um, of the judges that, that have ever seen us pitch have said to us um, that they'll remember it. And I'm sure Chris and Ed remember this one. Um, so to stand out, I decided to take along my 81-year-old grandma. And um, we put her in sunglasses and we had her saying all sorts of hashtags and young people lingo um, and I think uh, months and months later um, when I when I met people who'd seen that picture they still mentioned to me oh I remember that so if anything it's an opener in business it's this it's something that kind of breaks that ice of that conversation that I used to find difficult and um, so that's one of my highlights and um, another highlight is some of the sort of celebrity recognition that we've had. So again, it was taking our creative idea of turning photos into knitting patterns. And because this is quite unique, um, when we have knitted celebrities, they've, they've, they've been quite good in their response and reacted positively. So it's been quite a highlight to kind of get their attention. And then that's the same with um, media. So a couple of TV and magazines as well. Um, like what we're doing, they think it's creative, they think it's different, and they've um, shouted about it as well. And then my third creative highlight is what we're working on the moment. So it's the culmination of everything um, over the past two years we've been working towards is launching this platform, the idea. So it's it's finally kind of taken that moment from Budapest when I thought of it, to it now being a literal real life product that people will use um, and they'll be using it by the end of this year. So that is absolutely, one of the highlights. And um, so, so that's the end for me. Um, and I think I just want to say, be creative, be quirky. And yeah, give us a follow if you can. Thank you. Oh, and make people smile. That was my finishing line. <laughs> Heard your round of applause. Fantastic. Thank you, Lucy. That's brilliant. Um, I've got to say, it's been a privilege working with you these past um, year or so, you know, I think that when you came into the accelerator program, you kind of had a vision for what you wanted to do. But then there was a lot of hard work that went into that, you know, and I, I think that you have used those support networks really well. It's also a privilege because um, I have my face knitted, as does Edward. So, so um, Lucy did some nitpicks of the whole EIG team. So myself, Sally Graham and Edward have our own faces knitted, um, which is which is fantastic. Um, so thank you for that. Um, interesting, when you talk about your pitch, it is memorable. So when we talk about pitching, we talk it, about it being memorable, compelling and convincing. And certainly the first time that we saw you and your grandmother pitching, it was certainly memorable, it was convincing and it was compelling, you know. So um, any questions for Lucy, please post them into the, the chat there. Uh, and if there's anybody in the room that maybe has a couple of questions. Uh, while we're waiting for that, I'll kick one off. Um, you've had a lot of success, particularly with competitions 
and awards and things recently. What would you say that short term, because you're still very young business on the whole, you know, but what would you say that short term success is down to, Lucy? Um, I suppose it would be down to the hours that go into it. Um, Cause yeah, it's, anybody can have the idea, but we've actually really had to flesh it out. We've had to come up with, with like roadmaps that span years um it's it's more than just yeah the, the fun oh, bright shining thing there's so much behind it I think that actually backs it up and a lot of these competitions actually helped us to do that because they required things like detailed business plans and um, cash flows things like that that forced me to do the most like boring and mundane part of it in order to make it shine and make it what it is and um, so definitely uh it looks all shiny on the outside, but behind it is hours and hours of evenings and weekends spent slaving away. Definitely. The, the, the job of an entrepreneur, you know, I think that that's right. I think there's a question from the rooms. So um, are you going to, how are we going to do this? Uh, let me just check the chat there. Is there a question from the room? Yes. So your degree was in architecture that we spoke about. Um, so question is, um, are there transferable skills that you've taken from architecture, which is obviously kind of a creative um, profession, into your business? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think architecture is a funny one because it is a mix of sort of creative and science. It's kind of blending the artistic um, creation of space and place, but combining it with things like the structure and the technical requirements of actually making buildings stand up and meet regulation. So in that aspect, it kind of is quite similar to business in that it blends both sides that I kind of spoke about before in that pitch. Um, in terms of skills, I did learn a lot of creative things like so doing, um, we did like critiques during architecture. So I did learn how to speak and present. Um, also a lot of the arty skills and like programs like Photoshop and things like that have helped. But I think also just in terms of knitting, it doesn't sound like it's going to have structure to it, but there's a logic and a process in constructing a garment that's quite similar to constructing a building, if you if you go with me on that one. Um, so again, it's just taking like some of the processes that I've learned on that course and again, just applying them in a new way. Yeah. Any advice, that's another question there, any advice to entrepreneurs, you know, people that have got an idea and want to, to start a business? Yeah, the, the best piece of advice I had, and I was so skeptical of it um, in the beginning, was that you need to talk to people about your idea. So I was scared somebody was going to steal it. Um, I didn't want anybody to know I was going to lock it up in a room and hide it from everybody until it was ready to go. So this is me, what would that be, nearly two years later, and still not quite launched that initial idea. But the moments when it actually started accelerating and turning into something was when I spoke to people. It was when I went out to focus groups um, and spoke to knitters. It was when I had some of the mentors come on and advise me. Um, and even now still, there's there's so many different mentors that have like a completely different aspect and opinion on how we should approach like some strategic moves for like things like launching it and things like that. I would never have considered. So again, it's the more people that you can talk to, the more ideas you're going to have because they'll just They'll say something and it might not be the idea, but it's going to trigger and spark another pathway. Um, so yeah, talk about your idea as soon as possible would be my advice. Thank you, Lucy. It's always a pleasure to have you on and to hear your, your story. It's, it's an inspiring story. You've come so far in such a short space of time. Just quickly with Mother's Day, another plug. Or oh, ever the salesman, ever the saleswoman. Another plug. Where can people- uh, go on. <laughs> Check us out www.knitit.co.uk and give us a follow. Thank you. Thanks so much. Big virtual round of applause for Lucy. Woohoo! Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. So, thank you, Lucy. So, moving on um, now, uh, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker. Um, you probably know, most of you who know Edward will know he's a huge Lego fan. And so, he has a real kind of coup, coup to be able to uh, introduce. Uh, Morgan Walker. Uh, Morgan is the design director of experience and innovation at Lego's Creative Play Lab. And his main job is to help invent the future of play and inspire the builders of tomorrow with the, within the Creative Play Lab. 
which is a colorful mashup of a startup incubator and Santa's workshop. And he's the lead developer on products such as Lego Dimensions, Lego Juniors, Lego Video kind of franchises. Um, we all remember playing with Lego as kids. I remember I woke up on Christmas morning, I was probably about five or six years old and I got a Lego set. I believe we have some Lego on the tables in the room as well. Just give us a wave if you're playing with Lego in the room. Yeah, there they are, which is fantastic. So they've all got some Lego. Um, I know Edward, if, he's, if he would be here all night if Edward showed you his Lego collection, because I know he's got loads. I had to bring in my one, you can probably see it. Yeah, my Darth Vader that I've been working on that I got for my birthday from my colleagues uh, at RGU. So I've been working on that. So all huge Lego fans. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Morgan Walker, Design Director of Experience and Innovation at Lego Creative Playland. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Lucy. I'm totally sold. You, you're, you're definitely going to hear from me. Um, looks super awesome. So it put me down for uh, for Mother's Day for sure. Me um, hand over, yeah, from one and well put. You know, we, we definitely are knitting as a creative system, uh, as is Lego, um, and, and I recognise so much of what we do actually in in, in what you presented. Um, yeah, so you know, Edward gave me this this uh, challenge to talk about why play is a building block of innovation. Um, that, I mean, I think that should be fairly clear within Lego, I suppose. But um, I just want to give you a little bit of a sort of an insight into how we approach that with a few examples, and then um, you know, maybe just some tips and tricks, you know, processes, tools, and stuff that we use that that, that might be helpful. So just first of all, background, who am I, um, what am I doing, where have I come from? I've, I've spent sort of half my life designing stuff for adults um, and the other half for kids. Um, I started out life, you know, I studied product design engineering at Glasgow and I, and I designed a lot of um, products, medical products, kitchen stuff, car stuff. Um, and then you know, kind of, I, I got a job at Lego and then that's 10 years ago and I've just been completely lost designing lots of colourful um, play experiences for kids. And I think over that time, you know, really, I've been kind of reflecting a little bit on just how different I would say the design. And even I, I recognise some of that and what you're talking about, Lucy, about what it really takes to create and market a product. In many ways, you're actually creating experience. And that's kind of probably what's more communicable now is what, how products actually create really meaningful experiences. And I think that's definitely become a real, you know, kind of process and a, and a, and a real compass, I think, for us commercially. Um, so that's kind of what I want to really, really talk about. You know, I'm a product designer by training, but technically my, my job title now is I'm, I'm an experience director. And, and that's what I spend a lot of my time thinking about. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a few examples of, of how we do that at Lego. First of all, I want you to meet our audience. Um, one of the best parts of my job, um, by far and away, way more exciting than, than when things hit the shops, because we're normally absolutely, you know, we've spent four years working on it as well. But, you know, we've been through the same journey we were describing, Lucy. We're sick of the sight of it normally when it comes to shops, but the first time we get to show it to kids is by far and away the most magical thing. And that's really because kids are just completely honest um, in the reactions. We've had kids, you know, um, be so excited they've had a wee accident and had to go to the bathroom. That's like, that's about as high up in the scale as you can get. Um, we've just got so many stories about these kids. There's one I, I've told a million times, but I'm going to tell it again. Just, um, you know, when I first started at Lego, actually, I was working... Uh, testing a whole bunch of kind of action toys for boys and I was in a room full of like 12 to 14 year old kids and um, you know we were just kind of chatting after the, the session and I said to one of them you know so what are you going to do when you grow up then and he said oh I'm going to go come and work for Lego and I was like that's great you know we'll work together you know and this bear in mind this kid's like 12 you know so that's maybe I don't know eight years time and he said yeah but you'll be dead and uh, <laughs> and I just kind of, you know, obviously I was totally pissed myself laughing, but, you know, um, I love that honesty. And that's kind of exactly, in a way, that's quite telling. Like, I, that's kind of how I saw myself, you know, like, I'm cool. I'm down with the kids. I'm a designer. I work for Lego. And that's kind of how this kid's thinking of me is this totally out of touch old man. And 
that's 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 how, what we have to relate to you know that is empathy and that is when we're really looking for fun and we're really trying to create experience it's always really important to remember that it's not what i think is fun you know it's really just trying to get inside the mind of the, the, the people that we're designing experiences for and i know you know I don't know how many of you are designing toys. I'm guessing not tons of you around the table. I just, you know, we're going to talk a lot about kids, but I, you know, I've spent half my life also designing stuff for adults and, and it's been really revealing. You know, I, I have to say there's not a huge difference, I think, in terms of our actual motivations. Um, it's been really kind of helpful for me to actually tap into what is playful, what is fun. I think we always choose the fun thing, um, you know, we're just less honest about it as adults. We, we sort of kid ourselves on that that's what we're really after. You know, we put up with stuff that doesn't really work. Um, but if something better comes along and something genuinely is more pleasing and more pleasurable and more engaging, we, we go for it every time. So there, there's, there's great similarities, I think, even that we're talking about kids. I mean, adults still need to, particularly with technology, you know, they still need to be onboarded into new interactions. They still need... Um, you know, that to, to be communicated in a really emotive uh, kind of a way if your product, your experience is really going to make sense. So, you know, how we think generally about designing experiences, and as I say, when I say experience, it's not that I'm designing a digital experience, I'm, I'm just definitely thinking that's, that's kind of how we get to the product itself. With Lego, the product has already been designed. We, we're, we're still using many of the same bricks we've had for a very long time, of course, but we're really innovating on your relationship with the brick. We're, we're innovating on the experience itself. And the first thing we really need to think about when we're doing that is, is to think about how we actually want kids to feel. You know, what emotions are we going to trigger in, in kids? Um, I, I kind of an early example of this for me, this was like my first project at Lego. Um, was to work on the four plus line, which wasn't really doing very well at the time. <laughs> Um, we had known just for such a long time that kids found this transition from Duplo to, to Little Lego really challenging. You know, uh, one is, you know, all about kind of animals and basic stacking. And then all of a sudden, when you kind of miniaturize that, it's not just the, the kind of fine motor skills. There's a whole raft of challenges that come just with kids being able to figure out all of these steps and really get to, you know, actually creating this stuff. And that was a really big challenge for Lego because actually, to be honest, you know, four to six is actually the peak of the toy market. So there was definitely a feeling of kind of a missed opportunity, definitely a feeling we tried many times and nothing had really worked out. But I sort of came along at a really great time where we were up for giving it one last shot kind of thing. So, so that was my first uh, project. And, and the first thing we did really with a, a whole bunch of researchers is just really try to find out what was really going on. And we went on a, on a real road trip, you know, a lot of places in the States and around Europe. And we spoke to a lot of families and we ran a lot of creative workshops like this to try and really get to the bottom of this. Um, and if you've got kids, you'll know, you know, four, four or five years old is kind of a special age. Um, you know, these kids are just so imaginative. Um, and they're, you know, when you're three, you're not really capable of doing that much, but four or five, they're really starting to feel quite powerful. They're really quite coordinated. They've got tons and tons of ideas and no inhibitions. And also just really, really high expectations of what they think they can do versus what they actually can do. So this is kind of one of the main themes that we found with this little Lego it was just great, tons of amazing ideas. And then just kind of kind of frustration and crushing disappointment at not being able to realize them and you know one of the the interesting things really was that lego had always just seen this i think through the product lens you know we'd, we'd innovated we tried to make bricks easier to build we tried all sorts of you know kind of product focused innovations but we'd never really questioned the ultimate goal of this whole experience lego you know we're a company of just brick heads we love bricks um, and i think we'd you know, in a kind of an engineering mindset, we'd convince ourselves that the job of this product line was to teach kids how to build like a sort of tutorial. Um, and that was really where we started to kind of think about something different. We said, well, what actually, if that's not the goal, what if we're just trying to keep kids a little, engaged a little bit longer so they don't give up and maybe just those skills will come more naturally. So what we found was that kids actually didn't really want to build. That isn't why they were playing with Lego. 
they were playing with Lego because they wanted to role play, because they wanted to tell stories. Um, and that became a new goal. Like, how do we just stop kids giving up and just facilitate them to be able to start having fun and telling stories? So I think, you know, really this is for me and then for anyone starting a business, this is the most important part is really finding out what value you're trying to create and what the real problem is. And it's often not the thing that you think it is at the start of the process. So, and, uh, you know, we had our target emotion, or if you know the, the, you know, I think even since I made these slides originally, you know, we've been using a process called Jobs To Be Done, um, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about at the end, but we, we really figured out what it was we were trying to achieve for these kids. We wanted them to feel like they could do it themselves. And that's quite different to actually being able to do it. We just wanted them to feel confident and to enjoy that feeling. And that would be an experience that they want to have over and over again. So once we, once we knew that, we were starting to answer a new question. We started looking at, you know, what, what actually is it that kids are comfortable with doing themselves? You know, what, what can they do? And of course, there's lots of things that they understood. They, they were really good with basic structures. They knew that heads go on top of bodies, you know, fingers are at the end of hands and hands at the end of arms. You know, um, there's four wheels in a car. They, they definitely figured know all how to do all of that. And they were also just really, really comfortable with decorating. We don't just jump straight to creating our own pictures. We, we start coloring in other pictures first. We decorate, we put kind of sprinkles on cakes. We, we use stickers. These are kind of creative scaffolds that, that kids have been using a long time. But when we looked at Lego, you start to see the challenge. You know, that's not how Lego has been thought about. That's not how Lego has been designed. It, it wants you to think a little bit like a 3D printer. You know, you have to have all your ideas kind of ready in your mind before, and then you sort of execute the color, the form, you know, all in one step, which is just a bit too complicated for, for kids of this age. So we started actually just trying to kind of hack Lego, you know, trying to kind of reconfigure it to be able to achieve this experience. And we started designing a whole range of chassis that, um, that just kind of made sense in the same way that, you know, figures make sense, minifigures. Um, so there was chassis for cars that you just really, you know, you really wanted to put the wheels on, the shapes lined up. Um, and then the rest of it would really be decoration. You know, we weren't really that fussed about what particular kind of police car you made. Um, you know, achieving what was in the instructions was never the goal, but we gave you enough really recognisable bits in the box that you could make lots of police cars that you'd be really, really happy with. Um, and that was actually my daughter's helicopter, um, just when I was making this deck a, a wee while ago. Um, we're obviously a company that loves systems. So, you know, once we had those sort of basic ideas, we, we kind of tested it on helicopters and, you know, bin lorries and police stations, you know, and it, and it held up, you know, um, we, we, were, we were able to kind of make a product line out of that. And that was kind of the finished result, you know. Um, it still looks like Lego. It's very recognizable. That's that was kind of the goal. You know, it wasn't really to try and stand out and look really different. It was so it was kind of really clear that, you know, and, and it was really successful. And then this, this now the Junior's brand is gone. It's just kind of been absorbed into, you know, every product line. It's now the, the my first Lego experience. And I think it just, you know, because it, it kind of blends into the background, I think that almost makes it more kind of revealing that ultimately, you know, People buy products, but they're really buying experiences at the end of the day. That's where the value um, really is. So that was kind of a simple example. I'm gonna give you a more complicated one now um, and add another idea here. Um, so you know, definitely thinking about the emotion we wanna create, that's, that's one thing we do um, when we're designing things. Another is just really to tap into the, the actual values that we're trying to kind of bake into these products. Um, so working with, Ever since I've worked on Lego Juniors, I've been working mainly on sort of digital physical products. Um, and this is a difficult space, you know. Um, Lego has been around so long. Uh, it's just kind of one of the, a strange uh, kind of product in that sense that we've got, you know, so many people out there of my age and generation who have quite a nostalgic view on what Lego is. Um, especially parents tend to think of it as kind of the antidote to all of the screen culture that's, that's accelerating. And we've done quite well just to kind of balance these expectations. I think, you know, kids, on the other hand, 
a lot of the the Lego that they're building is part of you know video game franchises or you know massive kind of you know things like the Marvel kind of multiverse. You know they expect films, t shirts, video games, bedspreads. You know they, 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 it's a real kind of rich um, immersive world that they're you know placing Lego into. So our challenge really with that has just been you know I think this is to be honest this is this is what digital disruption looks like for us even though we've done okay with it it's not been easy and um, we're still really a plastic injection molding company at the end of the day and we really we don't have a lot of idea of what kids are going to be playing with in the next 10 years and um, we don't really have a clear answer to what technology is to invest in any more than anyone else Um, for that reason you know we've 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 got a lab, Creative Play Lab, where I work, um, where we just keep playing with stuff. We keep trying stuff out. We keep thinking like children. We keep making prototypes. We keep showing them to kids to try and get a sense of where where things are going. So we work a lot with these kinds of technologies. And we've released a lot of products. Um, you know, they've been pretty mixed uh, in their performance, to be honest. You know, and even I would say probably about eighty percent of them you've never seen because they've never made it out of the lab. It is a really tricky formula to get right. Um, like many technology-led things, I think the key thing is you know whenever certainly I'm working with technology. I mean, the first rule is it's not about technology. It's really easy to become a geek and get really, really you know excited about it when you're working with something new and you're being playful and you're being innovative. But again, kids don't really buy technology. They they just buy fun. And um, they buy experiences. And I think the challenge actually when working on these things is, is often um, just keeping your eye on the prize a little bit, just really being very sure that are you really designing in you know really meaningful value or is this just a gimmick? That's that that can be really, really hard to find out. We've also just really struggled to communicate these kinds of experiences. Again, back to the first slide, you know, um, I think kids get it, but quite often you know, um, expectations of Lego are still quite traditional um, and there's just a limit to, to how much you can break the idea of what's supposed to be in a box. Lego video, to be honest, hasn't been a big success. Um, I mean, I'd love to have done some more slides in that, but I was out with COVID last week and I didn't get a chance to put that in. So I'm going to go with an old example, if that's okay. Lego Dimensions, you know, it's uh, it came out in 2015. Um, so, you know, back in 20. 12 2013 was such a long time ago when we were working on this and um, we were thinking hey toys and video games you know video games are what like just such a huge industry even more than bigger than hollywood now it's just such a big part of kids lives and we really wanted to be part of that you know that world and um, and we started to think you know how could these two things come together in a mutually sort of beneficial way so our design brief you know avoid gimmicks find value the game needed to be really good. Obviously, if, if the game sucked, you know, forget the bricks. Um, the game needed to be more fun with toys. We didn't want toys to sort of feel like they were kind of getting in the way. We also wanted toys to feel really special um, in the game. You know, they're not just something that you just kind of had to use to unlock some digital content. And we really wanted it to feel, you know, like an authentic Lego experience, which meant, you know, working with lots of bricks that just we couldn't afford to put technology in all of them. So already sounding a lot harder um, but I think you know there's so many technology paths to solving this brief you could run it a million times you could run it once a year and you'd end up with a completely different solution but I think these values to be honest did the test of time if we if we redid this project today we'd probably do the same thing so the first one we really appreciated was that you know kids just really want agency you know they want control and um, that, that's that's the foundation of all good video games and I think the same is true of how kids really play with Lego. You know, um, at the time, it seems crazy, but this kind of man, you know, cross franchise mashup thing was something that a lot of the, these IP holders were really uncomfortable with. This was how we knew kids would play with Lego. They'd take Iron Man and make him into a policeman and they would mix up Gizmo with, you know, like someone from Batman or whatever. But, and that, that kind of anarchic, sense of just hacking all of these bits and telling your own stories just felt really empowering but um it was quite a new thing uh, back in that point and that's that's it that was the first the first thing that we just really wanted to make sure we we managed to do um which was a bit of a breakthrough really managing to top 
the, the you know the license holders of like the A Team and Harry Potter and Adventure Time and a lot of these very disparate themes to just let us create this big sandbox. Um, so that that was the first thing. The second was just that, as I say, just that feeling of control that we really wanted to target. Um, you know, and and there was a kind of a simple solution to this. You know, we had these little RFID tags that the, the vehicles and the figures would go on. And whenever you put the figure onto the, the toy pad there, you just saw in the video, you know, the little guy would just kind of be dropped into that world. And if you pulled him off again, he would be sucked back out of this, this little kind of vortex back out of the world. And as kind of simple as that sounds, as an interaction, it was kind of delightful. And it was very, very easy to kind of experience and enjoy and, and, and just get hold of. But I think where we knew we really had something you know, kind of more potent than that was when we started watching how kids played with it in kind of co-op modes. You'd get a lot of them kind of using it quite tactically. They'd be kind of dodging a bullet or they'd, um, you know, be sort of griefing each other. You know, they'd be kind of pulling their friend's figure off, uh, you know, off the portal while they were driving a car to try and kind of get them out of the way. So the fact that it was kind of quick and versatile and easy to use and actually kind of sort of started to become part of gameplay it was just a really, really promising sign. I think then we knew we had a good link between the digital and the physical that, that empowered kids. And then the last value, you know, this, this idea of just it being authentically Lego, you know, we didn't want it to just be Lego in name only. There had to be some kind of building experience. And this is what we all think of when we think of Lego, you know, just being lost in a kind of little dream world, putting your bricks together. And um, the challenge there is that video games are is just such a different experience you know it's also hugely immersive you know you're, you've got a big you know tv screen there kids you know with the cranking the sound up all got a controller and um, that's also a very very sticky experience but we pretty early gave up all hope of being able to kind of transition kids back and forward between those two states each of them was just too powerful in its own right um, so we, a big challenge for us was just to really figure out, what, you know, where was this building going to happen? You know, how, was, how are we going to avoid it just being built? I and mean, then that's it, you know, it, it, it might as well be made out of plastic. And the solution for us was really that we, you know, we wanted building to be something that would happen after probably mum unplugged the TV and said, you know, your dinner's ready, you've had enough <laughs> at the end of screen time. Um, and what... What we the way we designed it in the end was that you actually achieved uh, new building instructions, you know, but through gameplay, you know, you would actually unlock a rebuild of, of each of these little kind of vehicles, and that was kind of a, a reward. So you know, effectively you were kind of building your own trophy. So there was a real solid motivation there for doing it, um, and it was a really really nice first building experience for a lot of kids. You know, that probably were bigger gamers than they were builders. So. Those are just a couple of uh, examples, and I think you can see in both, you know, the, the, and even more so now if I've been able to do Lego video, like the experience, um, you know, we're so much more conscious of that being the thing that we're really delivering. So <clears throat> I just want to kind of finish off with just a few tools, um, you know, probably you know a lot of these. I mean, I think that's kind of the good thing, Lego, and we don't have any you know, super magical, completely proprietary tools. We're using a lot of the same startup tools that, that probably you guys are using. Um, but just in case, I'm, I'm just going to tell you some of the things that I, that I use in my daily work and, and how we've set ourselves up for experience innovation. I think it's probably, you know, worth talking like just briefly about the context, you know, like experience design. You know, we really used to make just this one experience. It just used to be you know, bricks and instructions, uh, printed instructions, and, that, and that's it. I think we've partly, I mean, I think probably the biggest thing now is probably the global pace of change. You know, people's expectations are changing faster than at any point before. You know, we've got a lot more new technologies that are available. And again, that sort of accelerates, you know, the race for kids' attention, you could call it. You know, uh, we're definitely working with new media, new experiences, new partners. And I think we just... It's interesting just to look at, I've just put a couple of slides to show you how we've structured ourselves to deliver innovation over the last 10 years, how much it's changed. So when I first, you know, I, I joined in 2010 and still around 2012, you know, when we we're starting up Lego Dimensions, this was kind of our process. It was changing, but 
Um, this used to be what, you know, this is what I got taught at, at uni, you know, that we, you'd just come up with a ton of ideas and you'd slowly kind of whittle them down. Um, and, you know, you'd really, that would really be in response to some kind of strategic brief from the business side of the company. So all the creativity was very much focused just on ideas for ideas sake. There wasn't really much more you could go on than that. You just had loads of ideas and the best ones won. Um, you know, maybe five years later, we had this kind of double diamond sort of process, um, which I think is quite familiar. I think the design council, you know, originally proposed this, you know, and, and what's changed really was that we spent an awful lot more time in this diamond actually trying to figure out, you know, what is it, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, so I wouldn't say there was a tremendous amount of innovation in how we, we actually ran projects, you know, maybe Agile 2017, we were starting to use a bit more trying to figure out how to run Scrum with outside of a software development, but more in physical development. Um, and there's maybe a bit more skunk works. We're maybe a bit becoming a bit more open to, you know, kind of bottom up innovation, you know, kind of crowdsourcing and, and ideas from all parts of the company. Where we are now, um, <laughs> I'll kind of explain, but I mean, I think the key, the key thing here is just that there's even more focus, I would say, on that area. Um, you know, what we run now is just really that there's always, there's le less of a pipeline and I think just more of an ongoing um, sense of missions being born, these little blue uh, kind of triangles. And, and then really we've, we're running a lot of projects at a lot of different phases. We're constantly trying to apply sort of design thinking increasingly to, to areas of opportunity. So, you, so creating products to try and understand whether their needs are even valid or not before we even spend an awful lot of time making prototypes and kind of developing, you know, test marketing materials. So we've kind of got a bit of a, you know, I think the intro you, you called it like a, you know, kind of a startup laboratory. I mean, it very much is that each one of these blue triangles might as well be a business. It's a group of people, cross disciplinary teams, really trying to figure out as if they were a startup, is there a business here? Do we have, are we creating value for, for a, a certain type of child or a family? Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, that, that, that's that all happened over the course of 10 years. And I think, you know, all, all the color coding aside, just to sort of break it down, I think three things have really changed. And I think that gives you a sense of the direction of innovation, not just in Lego, but I'm guessing in other companies. One would be that, you know, we've gone from being this big, top down, you know, the boss says do this um, kind of company. I don't think we were ever totally like that. But you know, we, we expected briefs to come from somewhere at a certain point. And I think not we've realized now is that the future is just way too complicated for it for anyone in the company to be able to do that. So we actually are in charge of finding the problems that we solve now. So there's a there's empowered startup minding teams responding to sort of a democratized strategy the company still does understand from a business point of view you know what needs to be true but not much more than that it's got it's got a concrete strategy but we take it forward um i think the second thing these two areas are where we've definitely spent more time and um, you know there's at this end of the spectrum the qualify and discover there's a lot more design thinking and sort of lean startup focus on early opportunities. And you could really characterize that as like the hunt for value. If you found value, then let's talk about making a product. But until then, let's not bother. And then at the other end, I think, you know, we're spending a lot more time on value propositions and go to market strategies. And that's really because it's just become increasingly harder to kind of launch a product, to be honest. Um, you know, there are so many new offers out there technologies changing you know even just in, in marketing like it's so fragmented no one's watching tv anymore there's no adverts how do we even communicate with kids yeah you, you do have to do stuff like uh, lucy was talking about you know it's really important to have stuff on instagram you know so that whole part of just packaging a fun play experience up and actually being able to put it in a box metaphorically and, and communicate it to someone that's become a real area of innovation for us because um because that's actually getting harder. So these are definitely areas I think, and I, I'm sure this is true for any kind of startups that you might come up with. And um, you know, cutting through these days is, is really challenging. So some tools in both of those areas that we use. Um, you know, if we if we talk about this earlier phase, 
the you know figuring out the right problem to solve. Um, if you're familiar with this one, if uh, you know that's great. If not, Google it. Uh, jobs to be done a methodology. Um, I think it's really about. You know, I think that the little sketch here is saying, you know, even though consumers buy this, you know, which is a whole bunch of skateboard parts, what they're really buying is this, you know, they want to look cool, they want to, they love the idea of, you know, being able to skateboard, it just looks really amazing, they love the fashion, I mean, you really need to figure out what is it that people want to do with skateboard, um, and what is it, if you, if, you're, if you are a really good skateboarder, again, what, why actually are, is that skateboard better than another, it's not as obvious, I think, as it once was. Um, especially with, you know, there being a digital component, I think, to a lot of products and, and how you discover products. So this is a really great methodology for just unpicking that, um, a bit like I've described, really trying to get to, you know, the experience that you're trying to create and, and get to the why. We also use Business Model Canvas, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, you know, we really try and break that down. You know, um, I think that's the other area that's been really exciting is just you know, design thinking, it used to be a room full of designers and then a, room, a smaller room full of marketing people. And it's now a much more collaborative uh, place. And, I, and I've definitely found myself in a lot more of, you know, these kind of business discussions. And this, this canvas, I think, really helps people, designers and marketeers kind of speak the same language. And um, the other end of the spectrum, sorry, my daughter's coming in here. Frida, I need to, I'm on the phone. No, I don't. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> At the other end of the spectrum, um, you know, as I said, how to actually get something out into the world has become harder. We we still use design thinking. Um, we we do an exercise a lot called riskiest assumptions, where you really just try and kill your own idea. You know, just think about what really needs to be true um, for this to succeed. You know, um, what, what's going to keep you awake at night? What, what would, you know, what if, um, you know, if this thing was proven wrong, you might as well just start again. That, that we always try and kind of be guided by that. Um, we use as well, like the value proposition canvas. Again, I think it's one thing once you've got a really, really exciting experience that you want to create. And it's another, you know, to really communicate that to the parents or the kids who are going to buy it and, and really understand, you know, how to kind of bring that to life. Um, and then lastly, you know, we, we were very guilty, I think, 10 years ago, spending huge amounts of money creating really, 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 really lovely prototypes um, that, you know, of things that ultimately weren't really going to go anywhere. And I think, you know, it's not because we're short of cash, but it's because we just want to iterate more. We're just very, you know, but we, we really focus on trying to, make the simplest thing, make the minimum viable product, first of all, and, you know, and also like, how can we get learnings? How can we fake it till we make it? How can we do, and, and the example here is that we did do a lot more fake door testing, you know, where we, we make Photoshop mock-ups and see if anyone clicks on it. You know, we try and get some data, like, is your idea any good? Do you think anyone would actually buy it before you spend a lot of time polishing it and really falling in love with it? So I'm sure probably a lot of these principles are familiar with you for you, but um, you know, maybe you're surprised to hear that we do so much of that, you know, in Lego. Um, and that's kind of really basically it for me. I think um, you know, fear not, we still spend the majority of our time thinking about how to make kids smile, but you know, but this is a real reality of 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 our business and everyone's, I think, is just how do we get that out in, into the world. Thanks a lot. I'll uh, Stop it there. Fantastic, Morgan. Thank you ever so much. That was a fascinating uh, insight into uh, Creative Play Lab and, and the world of Lego. Um, you know, you were talking there about lost in your own world. Again, I remember as a kid and actually as an adult as well, you know, during lockdown, when I, I mentioned I borrowed the Millennium Falcon from someone, the Lego Millennium Falcon, and I was totally lost in my own world, not just as a child, but as an adult playing with Lego. But that was a fascinating insight. Um, people, if you've got questions, you can start posting them in the chat or provide them um, to Aisha if you're in the room. Uh, I guess they'll continue to be playing with their Lego. They're inspired now to play with the Lego. It's great to see an X-Wing fighter in one of those uh, pictures as well. I saw the Lego X-Wing fighter from, from Star Wars. Um, 
but no, you know, thinking about the different models that you're using in Lego, and it's great to see, you know, those those models that you use. We do use a lot of those models. So jobs to be done, value proposition, business model canvas, minimal viable products. Um, I love the fake it till you make it. I've never used that one before, but um, I might steal that one. Fake it till you make it. So that's going into our next. We do a lot of fake tapes. Yeah. Mm, I like that. But no, a lot of those, a lot of those models, a lot of those strategizer models we use in, in our in our programs, that lean methodology. So it's great to hear that, you know, give me confidence that companies like, you know, Lego are using those um, is, is great. So um, Morgan, if you've got, so thanks for that, Morgan, it's brilliant. Um, if you've got time for a few questions, that would be Absolutely. great. Absolutely, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. So first of all, before, I'll do one here and then we'll go to the, to the one in the room. So um, this is from Ross McLean. Um, so Ross was um, the founder of Poco Coffee that I previously spoke about. Um, he says, how does Lego encourage play amongst its own staff? Do you have kind of playtime scheduled in your work calendars or do you have to go home and start playing with Lego with your children? We do actually, yeah. We um, we have a couple of things. We have, um, I think it's every third Friday now, we have a thing called Fabulab, which is really just a day where, at least in the design organization and product and marketing and, and design, we're encouraged to just work on our own projects, you know, just just spend a day just recharging your sort of creative batteries, uh, especially after COVID. I think that's become more kind of important. And we also have a broader thing that really tries to kind of bring everyone together from the people in the brand stores to the people working in the factories. We have a play day every year, which just really, you know, it really is about just everyone actually kind of playing together and just remembering as a company, you know, what it is we really do at the end of the day. Um, and obviously, I mean, you know, I, I don't know if you know, but we're, Lego give 25% of its money to the Lego Foundation. Um, actually, the way it's contractually that Lego Foundation own 25% of Lego, which is, I think, even more empowering for them. Yeah. So, and they are just a big, huge, um, you know, kind of research muscle onto, you know, the sort of pedagogical value of play and how we sort of empower people out in the world to, you know, take on that whole mindset. So, yeah, I think, yeah, they've, they've really built a temple of play out there in, in Denmark. Fantastic. I think we've got a question in the room. Is that uh, Xavier C? Yes, that's right. Can you hear us in the room? Yeah, we can, but it's not great. You might want to pop it in the chat. Oh, okay. You can have a go if he comes to the speaker, maybe. The microphone. Mm -hmm. No. Oh, sorry. Can Can't hear it. Aisha, could you put that in the chat for me? Okay, we'll, we'll get it in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. While we're waiting for that to go in the chat, I do have another one that's come in. I think this is from YouTube from Helen Bennett. Hi, Helen. How are you? Um, how innovative and creative do you think you can be in terms of sustainability? And do you think your current policies go far enough? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge topic for us at the moment. Um, I mean, there are a lot of initiatives underway uh, within Lego. You know, obviously, we've kind of we've been working on new materials, which I mean, if we can solve that, that's just a real boon for the world. But I can tell you, like, there's a, an absolute ton of just, you know, at the sort of chemical engineering level, and we've, we've released a few sort of plant based polymers. Um, and we're definitely starting to look at new models as well, just like circular models and, and all of that kind of stuff. I think for me, the thing that's always given me heart, obviously there's no, you know, kind of denying that we are, you know, still an oil based toy, but I think we're, to be honest, we're the sort of the kind of the perennial cradle to cradle toy, though. It's very rare for people to throw Lego out. Um, which I think is really good. You know, whenever we've kind of explored circular models, what we keep finding is that it's already happening. And that's not that we, that we don't want to do more of it, but, you know, a lot of people do keep it in the attic for the grandkids or they'll take it to a charity shop. It's very rare that they would chuck it in the bin in the same way that you might packaging or, or kind of like other, you know, kind of plastic goods. Um, but it's a huge one for us and, and we love a challenge. And it's um, so it's really become just a big innovation vector i think for us so i think we definitely see stuff in the, in the coming years yeah there's certainly a, a large secondhand market isn't there kind of on a, yeah, year, huge. a lot yeah. of the stuff that my sister's bought for her son has been secondhand market i certainly have all my lego from when i was a child you know yeah. it was in the loft it's now come out when my kids were 
were younger. It's now probably gone back into storage. It will come out when they have they have children um, yeah. as well. But yeah, um, is, is there eternal recycling kind of policies being developed? I guess it's again an area of innovation for Lego. Yeah, well, I mean that that would be the kind of circular models. Yeah, I think that and maybe kind of advocacy. I think we're definitely as a brand want to, you know, kind of help as well. Just you know, kind of raise awareness of the issue as much as we can too. So yeah, yeah there's a lot happening. Excellent. Another question um, from online is actually from uh, the vice principal um, for um, economic development and my boss. So it's Danella. Hi, Danella. Nice to see you online there. So um, great talk. Uh, great to hear that, you know, what you use in Lego is very similar to the kind of models that the startups are using as part of our own um, regional accelerator as well. How do you think innovation differs in a big company compared to um, a kind of startup might like Lucy's maybe? I mean, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, I, th I guess that's why I tried to sort of pre present, you know, if I just told you how we run things now, I think, it, you know, you might miss the picture that in, in many ways, I think we have had to start thinking much more like a startup, you know, to be honest. Um, not the whole company, because obviously we're enormous and we have that luxury of, you know, that we're not in the same sort of, you know, challenge that you are genuinely when you're starting up a business with cash flow and kind of resources and all that sort of stuff. But I think a lot of those kind of big, you know, kind of corporate innovation lab practices, you know, have, you know, definitely kind of given way to, to kind of more you know, uh, faster kind of agile startup techniques. So I think, and it's been a really healthy transformation, to be honest. I mean, I, just the amount of money that we would have spent on five big bets previously, you know, we, by trying to kind of be more startup minded and just trying to ask the essential questions that you know, that we all ask and we're all a lot better at asking now um, around business viability or desirability or feasibility. It does allow us to just explore the space a lot faster and, and just do what we're good at, which is just getting to the to the play part. So I think we've definitely been very inspired by the startup world. And that's 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 how we think. And a lot of our, our leaders have come from that world, to be honest. No may that continue. And we've got a really international audience um, tonight, Morgan. So we have Andy from Havana is watching um, at Atalaiba from Angola and Oyoma from Nigeria. So they're all listening live. So hello to all of you and thank you for joining us oh. this evening. Um, so and my question relates to that actually. Um, are, do children from different cultures and different international areas interact with Lego differently? Um, that's a good question. Um, or is play just play is just play? You know, kids, kids just play. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we've definitely always observed, you know, it's not probably not a surprise that Lego was came from Northern Europe where where there's cold winters. It's a very, it's a very insidey toy. Um, whereas I think a lot of the kind of hotter countries, you know, kids are outside more, you know. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest one. And then I think I don't think there's major differences in terms of, you know, how kids develop and, and what they're interested in. I think Lego is really you know, obviously tapped into something around construction play that's pretty universal. Yeah. Um, and, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we maybe would have thought it was a bit more boy than, than girl. And that's that's definitely not, you know, what Lego believe. And, and I'm, you know, kind of really constantly doubling our efforts to just make that distinction very clear that it, we're, we're for boys and girls. Yes. I think maybe the only thing is now that I think we're a little bit more where we were a construction toy exclusively maybe you know 50 years ago i think we're you know because there's so much so much culture i think in, in in a lot of the stories that we're telling are a lot more nuanced um there's there's that's maybe a an interesting thing we've, we've we've recently launched a whole line that's really china specific okay um you know and and clearly that just culturally they don't really have the same history with lego that we do we've you don't get grandparents who grew up with it so they don't really understand it on that level and that that was really important for us that, that it, we designed it with Chinese designers in China about Chinese culture. And I think that just kind of shows Lego is at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's a bit of a chameleon. It's really the ideas that you put into it. It's the stories that you chose to tell with it. And, and I think we'd love to do more of that, you know, just really tap into 
what matters to different cultures. So yeah, yeah I'd love to love to do a project in Cuba. I've been there before and really, really loved it. And I haven't been to Angola, but um but yeah, along with that continue. Yeah. And I guess this whole bit of nostalgia, you know, so so Ed, Edward in my in my team, as I said before. There he is, Edward. Um, he is uh, a big Lego fan, you know. There he is. Hi, Edward. Do you, do you have a question, Edward, being a huge Lego fan and having, you know, every possible <laughs> Lego, you know, because because a lot of what me and Edward, I guess, and people of our, I, well, he's slightly younger than me, but at my age, certainly. There's his look. There we go. Oh, That's wow. That's there we go. On the international options, I've literally, this is my latest one, so we can plot all the different places on it. That's great. <laughs> That's a good one, that. I'm going to break it now. Certainly, you know, those going into the nostalgia, you know, going for the Star Wars things, you know, going back to their childhood and, you know, buying Lego. And some of it's, you know, premium priced as well. You know, so what's kind of, tell us a little bit about the nostalgia market. Um, I mean, I think nostalgia, as I talked to you a little bit in the, the, the deck there, it's, you know, it, if it you know it depends very much when we're talking to parents or when we're talking to kids. Um, you know, and we're always sort of talking to a little bit both because, of course, at a certain age you don't have your own pocket money. You know, it's your parents. But I think more recently we have you have started to see that we've targeted adults. We've always held back a little bit on that, to be honest. And um, we didn't want to come. You know, and we're very careful about it. The strategy isn't to try and kind of milk adults, you know, because we know we can. Um, <laughs> it's very much about, you know, but we just, we also really have to appreciate that many, you know, huge fans of, of Lego just grew up and didn't stop loving the brand and are kind of ambassadors for the brand and do create a lot of play experiences together with their children. So that's kind of where we are now is that we are starting to kind of, make more toys for adults but only where we believe it's going to bring more play ultimately to kids that it's going to bring you know kind of great memories and activate yeah. activate a, a, a mom or a dad in, in the household so yeah. Yeah. yeah it's really interesting I mean of course there's a lot of new sets there I think one of our biggest sellers last year was a complete surprise it was the flower bouquet set that came out yeah. right. and I think you can really see like you know my mom absolutely loved that set and just wouldn't have really been a target for lego until something yeah. like that came out it's all back to the future set on linkedin today i think that was a yeah i don't know if ed's going to be buying that one in the in the future yes his thumbs yeah. up another question from the room so to be on a lego design team is there a choir type of university degree e.g uh, would a textile designer be relevant i think there might be a textile designer in the room that wants a job <laughs> we have quite a few textile designers I know and uh, yeah I mean obviously there's a small team that work on all the capes but uh, that's probably not what you mean but actually yeah I mean, I, I, like there's I think I think really we're not we tend to take a lot of or used to take a lot of industrial designers but there's always a lot of the textile designers I can think of two or three who are also amazing builders just have a brilliant sense of colour and pattern and you know, the Lego Dots team, for example, there's quite a lot of really, really amazing textile designers working there. I think people can come from any background, to be honest. I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's pretty clear we're designing Lego and all the graphic design, the experience design and the product design that goes with that. Um, and that's what counts. But yeah, we, we, we take people from a, a range of backgrounds. Yeah. Okay. Lucy, did you have a question? I can see you looking and listening, obviously you know some in terms of the creative industries yeah no I'm, I'm quite interested in um what's what's your role within the wider world of lego like you you talk about designing a lot of these products um are they uk based ones or is there is there somewhere more central in denmark or are you are you the top of lego like I, i'm interested in the company structure and how how it fits uh, into the bigger picture yeah I mean, I, I I have moved back to Scotland after living in Denmark for 10 years, and um, that's part of a kind of a, a strategy that we are starting to open hubs in other places, but to, that, that really only began, you know, probably three or four years ago. And up until then, all of our design was entirely in Billund, and still 80% of it, 90% of it is, you know, if you're building a model, you kind of have to be there eh, where all the bricks are, but we do have like a a London hub now and a Singapore hub, you know, and I, and that's also part of just kind of diversifying and, and just kind of making sure that we 
we are attracting talent for different, you know, you know, just understanding the world in a more kind of inclusive way. Um, but as as far as where I fit in, I work for Creative Play Lab, and I'm one of you know um, a bunch of directors there. I'm not I'm not the boss of Lego. Um, my department's quite big. There's maybe about two hundred of us now. Um, we just kind of merged also with a, a big technology department, so we could become more holistic. So we've got all kinds of people, uh, designers, interaction designers, model designers, graphic designers, you know, um, molding engineers, technology people, computer vision people, anything we'd need to kind of pull off that play. And, and our role really is to come up with all the kind of stuff that we've never really done before. Um, the rest of the business looks a little bit more like you'd probably expect there is a harry potter team there is a star wars team there is a minecraft team and they opposite operate almost like businesses within their own right with their own marketing leads and design leads and designers and marketeers and all that and um, but their scope of innovation for them is a little bit narrower you know obviously it's we, it's pretty high geared stuff you know we can't you know we are still on a manufacturing cycle and christmas is you know what we're aiming towards Two years out so we those lines can't really be taking big innovation risks and um, so that's where they either bring us in to help you know kind of maybe a year in advance we'll do if they're doing something really really new and different will involve us or it, you know new product lines like lego video or lego dimensions or something you know that just had a completely different operating model different technology than we've ever produced before would be incubated there and then would become you know a standalone product line so we're kind of a lab that feed in whenever, wherever we're doing something a bit kind of new and unusual. Um, okay, great. I think we've got time for two more questions, Morgan, if you can. Yep, that's fine. Okay, we've got time, great. So the first one um, was from Ashley, um, who I think is might be watching on YouTube. Hi, Ashley. Um, how do you nurture the ability to step back from the adult expert mindset, design expert mindset? and act as a conduit for kids' ideas without imposing that adult logic. Yeah, that's a great, a great point. Yeah, I mean, a bit like you said, Lucy, I mean, it's just, you know, you, you take your idea to the kids and then it's just immediately clear um, if you're doing that. I mean, I think that is just the, the absolute joy working with kids is that there is not a big filter there. They don't feel they owe you anything really. And we're quite often behind a one-way mirror and there's you know a moderator we, we do it both sometimes we just work directly with kids but it's also quite easy to lead kids it is a bit of an art form not going do you not think this is really cool and they go yeah i think it's really cool i mean we're also coming into a room and throwing a whole bunch of toys on the ground and most kids love that so yeah so i think it's really that actually isn't a big challenge you know and um, i think it, and as i said that is to be honest that is the highlight of the job is whenever we take stuff to a test yeah. it's our best guess and it's undoubtedly got our own ideas about yeah. uh, you know what kids like and that's why this is so important that we are such a diverse design team because we all come from different cultures and different backgrounds but when we put stuff in front of kids i think that's the kind of the moment of truth and uh, they normally make it pretty obvious if, <laughs> if they like it or they hate it yeah we talk a lot about empathy you know empathy you're going back to the design thinking methodology a lot of what we do is talking about empathy you have you have to walk in the shoes of your customer when you're not you know yeah. when you're not this that have that mindset then to get that insightful mind of of the child and and you know and that must be so much fun that must be so much fun that's great yeah, edward, right. had, had, edward had a question although he showed us his globe he did, he did have a question so with that move to a most most sort of holistic view of understanding problems rather than coming back from a brief do you face creative blocks? So what do you do if you're having a blank day where those ideas aren't flowing? Wow, that is the biggest question of them all, isn't it? Um, <laughs> coffee, coffee is a good idea. Uh, you know, um, no, it's a good point. I think, I'll, I mean, I think that, I mean, this is maybe just my personal kind of reflection. At least she jumps in a swimming pool by the sounds of it or goes and has a bath. 
That is also true. I mean, I, do, I think that's uh, yeah. all of my ideas don't really necessarily, my really good ones don't tend to happen within working hours. And I think that's that, you know, you, you do kind of inhabit a problem for a long time and you do struggle with it and you do, you do definitely have your blank days. Um, I think it depends where you are in the process. Like generally, even though we're, as I say, we're quite empowered to come up with ideas. We don't, I don't think we would really start from a blank sheet of paper. I think it's really important to try and solve a problem for someone, you know, either for the company or the kid. Um, so if, we're, if, if you just find yourself coming up with just an idea, I, I, I think that's a bit random. I think if I really don't have anything, I think I would probably go, go and research something, you know, go and try and learn more about something, try and find the kernel of a need or a, or a different opinion or a different sort of point of view. Um, you know, that's that's probably where I would go. I mean, it's rare. I, I haven't really ever sort of come up with an idea just just from a blank sheet of paper. It's, I mean, that, that just kind of the nature of the job. I think it's generally trying to make something fun and delightful, but it, but it is for a reason at the end of the day. Fun and delightful. That's a great, a great quote to end on there, I think. So everyone that knows me will know how much I love my job. I love the job that I do. I get to work with some fantastic people and meet some amazing people. But I think you may have the best job in the world. <laughs> we can all bad. agree on one thing, that you have a fantastic good. job in the world. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. So listen, Morgan, thank you ever so much for joining us uh, this evening. It's My been pleasure. a pleasure. Thanks for having pleasure. me talking to you fascinating insight into the job and the work that you do at lego and long may it continue we're all big lego fans certainly in the, in the team but most of the people i know are and we will continue to you know build our lego models and play with lego for a long time to come i think so thank you ever so much morgan thank you also to lucy is lucy still there thank you to lucy for joining us as well this evening big round of applause virtual round of applause for both morgan and lucy for joining us this evening um, and it really just remains for me to, to say to everybody, um, uh, thank you for, for coming as well. We know that, you know, you've had a long day at work uh, or studying. Um, and so for you to join us on a, on a Monday night is much appreciated. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we certainly did. A few uh, events for your diary. So on the 23rd of March, we're doing a conducting business sales. So anyone that's interested in business sales, they can come along to that. On the 29th of March, we have a workshop on the Converge Challenge. So those entrepreneurs that are looking to apply for the Converge Challenge this year, um, we'll do a workshop on that. So you can find out more about how to do that, how you can uh, develop a, a good, solid application for that. So that's on the 29th of March. And then on the 6th of April, being a storyteller, we spoke about, Morgan spoke about storytelling, the importance of storytelling and how, you know, to have a compelling, memorable story. So being a storyteller on the 6th of April. For more information on those events and to book on those events, visit rgu.ac.uk forward slash events and you'll find those events on that web page and you can book from them as well. So that's it. All it remains for me to do is thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks again to Morgan and to Lucy. I hope you've enjoyed the Innovation Masterclass uh, series that we've had. There's more coming, so look out for more coming. We will be inviting you to lots more in the next semester. Uh, and that's it from me. Thank you all very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Cheers, everyone. Bye.